If you are looking for a tech job, think you may be soon, or currently stuck in a tough situation, this is the episode for you. I have with me today Julie Chase and Mai Hong from Dream Job Catcher. They've helped hundreds of clients that are almost exclusively over 40 land their dream jobs. So despite the layoff headlines right now, their clients are still getting amazing offers right now. So you'll want to learn their tips for success in this job market today. Uh, We're going to take a look behind those headlines and give you some more hopeful news and empower you to take some control over your career even right now. We're also going to have a lot of real talk and laughter and some insights mixed throughout. So hopefully that will bring a little bit of levity and fun to a subject that can sometimes be a bit dry. Julie also recently added author to her resume and has a book appropriately called Dream Job that's out there now revealing their proven methodology with all their clients. So worth a look there. So tune in to discover exactly how you can nab your dream job anytime and at any age. Hi, ladies. It's so awesome to have you here on It Gets Late Early. I am pumped. I love that you're in Seattle, but not here because I don't have like a Joe Rogan setup yet. So sorry about that, but love to see you virtually. Soon enough. Yes. Soon enough. Great to see you. Dreams, goals. Speaking of dreams, can you tell me a little bit about how Dream Job Catcher came to be? Yes, we can. Well, Maya and I have been at a lot of startups. So, you know, we were kind of getting frustrated and tired, maybe burned out, you know, the whole <laughs> experience. Maybe. Burned out some things. about early stage ones. And so, so we kind of came together. We both had left our jobs and we were looking for something more fulfilling. And we, we both have a marketing background. And so, you know, the, the natural thing would be to do some marketing freelance work, which we did for a while. Um, and I had the side resume business for years and we were sharing a co-working space and my was, you know, like kind of listening to some of my calls with clients and, you know, I ended up doing some, you know, free coaching on interview prepping and networking and that kind of thing. And she's like, you know what, that's the better business idea to help people uh, make some career moves, especially in tech when it's like, there's a lot of variety of different kinds of companies yeah. as we had experienced. And yeah. so, you know, we yeah. decided to form Dream Job Catcher just to help people. Absolutely. And yeah. I think that when I was eavesdropping on you, <laughs> so much that you were helping Good them. things can come of that. Yeah. <laughs> Interview prep or, um, which, which is really helpful, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was really helping with the clarity because, mm. because of the variety of the tech companies, um, Depending on your age, depending on you know, <laughs> things that you enjoy, you're helping them find the alignment, which then makes their jobs are so much more simple um, by yeah. finding that clarity first. So, yeah, yeah, I thought it was great. Yeah, yes, I love that. Yes. And I know one thing that I, I can definitely attest to is is Julie's strengths and gifts in this arena because you, for whatever reason, actually kind of took me under your wing when we were working together at one such tech company forever ago and out of nowhere basically mentored me and told me what to do and what not to do and took my resume and made it 10 times better. And so I've seen you do this even before it was your actual full-time job. You did this kind of for fun. So I don't know what that says about you, Julie, but yeah. you are really good at it. And I'm just, I'm so thrilled to see that you made that passion of yours, like an actual job and you brought the perfect person along with you to make it happen in my, so for sure. uh, yeah, absolutely yep. love that. So yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for being here, which is yes. fantastic. So basically it's, it's, it's kind of an interesting moment in the tech world right now. And I know your whole your whole go-to-market approach is really landing people their dream jobs and getting them to be intentional about where they end up, which is lovely. Like I love the difference and the differentiation that you draw between the organic career and the intentional career. And so I guess I'd love to hear a little bit about how you view today's tech landscape and hiring trends and what your candidates are seeing and what kind of jobs they're getting. Just give me kind of a lay of the land. That would be great. I can give a tangible example of what I hear people are feeling. And then I can also give a tangible example of what's actually happening. So people are feeling worried. Um, People are seeing lots of headlines. People are feeling, um, I guess, apprehensive is the word. So by the time they, you know, connect with Dream Job Catcher and they're there to talk about, I guess, their worries, you know, it's like seeing things like big tech layoffs and, feeling like they're getting aged out or, you know, things are really different and changing in the landscape. 
Um, but at least they're asking the question. And then when they ask the question and they get an answer, they feel less worried, right? So it's better to talk about it than it is to just like, like have it float around because at the end of the call, people are just like, oh, I feel so much better that I voiced it, right? And that's like one thing about like things like ageism or any sort of ism. <laughs> when, once you talk about it, you get better clarity. But right now, the thing that I hear most on my calls is that people are feeling like, there's too much noise in the market. They're applying to things online and they're not getting a response back because, you know, the market is flooded with all these amazing people from Google and Meta. Um, but if you really do take a step back and you look at the real data behind some of the other headlines that don't get a lot of attention um, is that there's actually four times amount as jobs as there were people who were laid off um, in Q1 and, um, and yeah, this year, uh, yeah, yeah, and this, this is year. like very recent. Um, and then Julie can attest to this like, th the offers have been amazing, so mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And, and one thing that we should clarify is my handles all of our strategy sessions, which are our sales calls. So she talks to a high volume of people, you know, hundreds of people, and and I work with you know, dozens of people at a time, so um, so she has a much more um, she has a better feel for the pulse of like, yeah. you know, of macro the, versus micro. Of, of yeah. what's going on. Um, yeah. And like, you know, like, hey, we work with um, clients who have been laid off too. like, you know, have had experiences from mostly, I think, actually exclusively from the big tech companies, the FANG type companies. And so, yeah. um, so, you know, they've gone through their kind of, you know, emotional roller coaster or cycle. It's a journey. Uh, so, yeah. It's, a journey. Yeah, it's very, very real. Um, I, but I think it's like, it's always just good to have a reference point because when you're laid off and I've been laid off twice. So like, I really understand the turmoil that, you know, comes with it, but um, there are t over 12 million professionals in the tech industry. And so far, you know, from 2000, 2022 and 2023 so far, it represents less than 2% right now. So we're, we're nearing 2%, so getting close to that. But it just gives us some context because I think the way the media portrays it and we see it in the daily, you know, headlines, it makes it almost feel like every job is being taken, you know, and it's every, there are not. Yeah. I'm an ex news person. And I can tell you like beneath the headlines, that's, that's where you need to go. And it's so easy not to, it's so easy to read the top, top lines and just get this complete perception that doesn't necessarily line up with reality. And so thank you for exposing that. Um, I mean, by the way, like I used to work at court TV and I can tell you, I thought literally everyone wow. was a murderer and that was my doing. <laughs> Right. That was yeah. on me. So sorry. <laughs> I could walk around New York City and be like, oh, my God, is someone someone out to get me. Yeah. It just it colors your perception. So I think it's good to peel it back and actually level yeah. it with some data here and there. So thank you yeah. for sharing that. And it's yeah. it, it's such an interesting thing. Right. Like you pointed out, there is this emotional aspect to it. It's real. Like the people who are going through this are in it. And it's so tough. And there is a glut of talent from those top companies. Like that's, that's legitimate. Right. And so it's, it's not that there's like, like, I understand the concerns, but it's good sometimes to see the forest through the trees and just like understand yeah. what's actually happening at a big sort of bigger picture level. Right. So yeah. I love that. Yeah. Because that, that will make you feel better. I think. And um, cause when you're in it, you can't really make great choices from the, the, the in it part right so yeah and like and then if you just step away from it for a little bit whether that's like doing something a little bit different for fixating like your mind is so powerful you just have to give it a better problem to solve and yeah yeah that's it's i often <laughs> equate everything to dating so it's like you're in, you're that. Oh my god i gotta meet my person because like i have to do you know start a family do this and do this and so like it has to be now you know but like you feel like there's a scarcity of Yes. Uh, can no candidates or whatever. Yep. Candidates. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, then, and then it doesn't feel good and you might, you know, inadvertently go into a relationship that you don't even want. Right. And so yeah. it's like the same thing with the job search. Like you, if you're coming from that kind of place, it is hard to land a really great job. But if you can give yourself some time to process and like time and space, you know, kind of helps with everything, then you can come from a much more grounded uh, part and then get a really great job, you know. 
Yeah. I love, I love that you use that analogy of dating too, because I have, I've thought that so much. It's like the, the whole interviewing process and the, the negotiation wow. process. It's kind of like the hard to get, the, like, it's <laughs> so, like, there's so many parallels with dating. It's ridiculous. Right. So I love that you see that too and that you tell your clients that. That's fantastic. So, okay. Wow. So covered a lot of ground there. I feel like, What's interesting about what you just told me too, Lai, is that you kind of play this this role in in leveling with people who are coming to the table, like thinking about these issues and whatnot. You kind of almost have like a therapist bent to you too. Like yeah, you, you have to yeah. help people process this stuff. And then, oh. wow, that, that must be interesting. I guess because if you boil anything down, it's really how you feel about it, right? So if you can work that out, then you could come from a place with like much more much more mindfulness, I guess it's the, the short word of that. But yeah. yeah. So, so clearly you have had just tons of candidates come through. Well, I guess they're your clients, tons of clients yes. come through that you've helped and coached on their ways to wonderful intentional careers. Can you talk to me a little bit about the difference between an organic career and an intentional career? Yes. An organic <laughs> career is one where, you know, you kind of take jobs that come your way. It's, it's like the, the path of least resistance, like, you know, and it makes you feel good because it's a former manager who comes to you or a colleague and, you know, says like, Hey, we're it's hiring a group or <laughs> we're hiring. And it's a special. Special. It's special. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we don't even like most of the times we don't even ask ourselves, you know, what do I want first? And then try to see if it's a good fit. We just see like, you know, what we re- re- really do is compare for what we have and what they're offering. So then it's like, you're not even, you're kind of almost like, extricating yourself out of the the uh, decision-making because it's like, okay, now this job has this and my job now has this and this and this. And so, which is better? Like, you know, it's like the pros and cons list, but um, you know, so it's, that's what is mostly an organic career. And sometimes I have people that are are almost boastful. Like I've never had an interview for a job because I've always been given one. I'm like, Oh, well, and how has that been working for you? You know, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so really good. Sounds good on its face. Yeah. Yeah. So. But why are you here today with me? <laughs> right? Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. And, and then the intentional one is like where it's like, hey, I am going to take the time to determine what's most important to me in terms of my values and my lifestyle and my career goals. And then I'm going to create this, you know, this list or these goals that I that are important to me. And then I'm going to take the steps to find alignment, you know, with my next move. So it really is a strategic career move. It's often proactive, even when sometimes things come to you, but you have this foundation or this, what I call this benchmark, then you're able to evaluate it on its own, not based on what you have currently have or don't have, you know? Yeah. So I think that's the yeah, main difference. Makes so much sense. Yeah. yeah. And organic like- could be good. And it's what created your expertise but when you switched intentional, you have more of what you actually need. And so, yeah. yeah. And by the way, I learned to speak the hard way. Like I had mostly <laughs> an organic career. I only had uh-huh. a couple moves I'm in my sorry, entire son. career of 20 years where I was like, okay, here's what I want. And this is why. And then get it. You know, like that was, that was much. Yeah. And so I, I'm bringing it from my own experience. And then now I can say from the hundreds of clients I've worked with. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, uh, your lived experience led you down this path, right? You figured out this is the way to, to show up in the world. And here you are. That's, that's yeah. cool. But I, I, wanna, I mean, if I wow. could bring it back to Please. Like, the intentional part is, is that you get to evolve and grow as a human. And part of that is aging, right? Um, but we, but because, so, so when Julie mentioned, like, how is that going for you in terms of um, like, I've never had an interview before, right? Um, <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Two separate skill sets here. One is your career and your career trajectory and your life and getting older and things like that. And there's a job search element. Um, but when you're getting older and then you have to, I mean, you've never done this before, um, you start to question, like, and those are the, the you know, the people who are like, I've never had to look for a job before. And then now I'm interviewing and I'm pretty sure it's because I'm older that I'm not making it through. And then it just becomes a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, so there's like kind of some separation there that isn't created. Um, I think it's all one thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I'd say well, like it, it, 
out of that, uh, out of all of our clients anyway, it age gets brought up the least, but, but there's some things that are probably very parallel to it. It's like, Hey, I didn't build a career in one domain. So like I, my background's very general or I didn't do this or I don't have this MBA or I don't whatever. I, I love, I yeah. love what you just said. And it's like, people are always searching for answers, but sometimes it's right in front of them. And it's like, Hey, you haven't, had a lot of experience interviewing, like maybe that's the issue, right? Like right. you haven't been in this situation before. And, and to, to some degree, I say, lucky you, that's fantastic. You've cultivated some sort of track record where people want you. You have a great network right on. Amazing. Yeah. But if you break free from that and you're a novice at interviewing, like mm -hmm. it's different. And so yeah. people, I feel like are looking for answers for why things don't work out. And, and sometimes it's, it's like we grasp different. something. Yeah. 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 It's different. And, <laughs> and so- yeah. yeah. When I work with younger clients, it's like, Hey, I don't have enough experience in this or that. You can't and win. I work with older clients, <laughs> more experienced right. clients. It's like, Hey, I don't think I had the enough experience in this one thing that I should have had, you know? And so again, like something that Mai said earlier is like, it's all about the comfort, how you feel about the thing that you have, because sometimes it's just like, you know, when people walk me through their experience, I'm like, wow, this is really impressive. And, really great. <laughs> and they'll be like, really? Cause I'm missing this, this and this. I'm like, oh, well think about it this way. You know, <laughs> kind of like we're giving them a different perspective. So yeah. because when they feel good about their experience, then it makes the whole it, like job search much easier. They feel good about what they can bring to the table, yeah. how to present themselves and position themselves. Yeah. And that's really, I think the intangible part yes. of the whole interview process and connecting with people where they feel really good about you. That makes it easier for those people once they get to that point. Yeah. And that confidence is so attractive. Like yeah. that is just, it pays off in spades. And so if you can, if you can learn how to flex that muscle and cultivate that, that's a gift and not everyone can do it really naturally. I think uh, I would I would say that naturally I think this comes less easily to women just based on how society has told us we have to show up in the world. But it's right. something that if you can nail it, it's gonna it's gonna really really help you out. And mm -hmm. so, yeah. do you how do you how do you approach these things with your clients? Like how how do you help get people in the right mindset to have that sort of like abundance mindset versus scarcity mindset and like show up with their fullest best self and show up with confidence? How do you how do you get them there? Yeah. Well, we. The people who tend to invest in themselves have some kind of growth mindset because they believe Fair. like, hey, if I can learn something, if I can apply something that we that is proven to work, then I can get something, you know, like something great, not just right. get a job, but get a great job, you know, and I define the dream job as one that you love and thrive in. And so, um, so they're already like have some belief in themselves, right? Because they're making this investment in, in this program or, or whatever they're doing. Um, and then I think. It's really just, you know, I, I say one of the best benefits of coaching is just getting out of your head because yes. like people will just like, <laughs> like tell the story of whatever they're missing or like lacking or how they're not going to be able to be successful in some way. And it's not even true. It's not even based on anything that's it's literally not reality. true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's just like kind of like, you know, so sometimes it's just asking the, the right questions like, oh, yeah, you know, how did you, you know, why is it that you think that? Or like, you know, can you give me an example of when that's happened? Or, you know, like just kind of like diving in a little bit deep and then like kind of saying, well, what if, you know, like, and sometimes it's just sharing pure facts or data like, you know, hey, we've worked with six clients this month who have gotten offers at these companies um, at this level. And that kind of thing. And it makes them feel like yeah. it's possible, you they know, do. for them. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then when J Julie notices like a thought that could be very like internal, it's about sharing the new belief and then just reinforcing it. So, it, so, so it's basically you're looping it back to a better thought. Right. Um, and, and they do that yeah. right, right from the start. Yeah. yeah. And it's not something like, oh, if, if they think I'm stuck at this and it's like, oh, no, but you're fantastic. It's like incremental changes, like, you know, like, oh, you know, like compared to some, like the top person in the company. Sure. Like, you know, you may not be as good, <laughs> but how about like, you know, compared to your peers or, you know, your manager even, you know, and it's like just starting at those kinds of incremental, like just, yeah. you know, ideas. Yeah. But, just kind of shifting just slightly, ever so slightly. Yeah, yes. totally. Yeah. It makes a huge difference over time. So I can, I can see that. I mean, 
it, I love that so much of this, it, it really kind of goes back to the sorts of things you would work with, like a therapist or a friend with, like you are calling out things that you've been able to observe over time that people don't, people don't know about this. Like people aren't always all that introspective or, you know, they're not inwardly focused in that way. And it's, it's so cool that part of what you do is really digging that stuff out and bringing it to the surface and helping sort of like get people ready to go into the world and leave that kind of stuff behind. That's not serving them. Love it. Yeah. Love yeah. It. I, I believe everyone wants to feel good when they, yeah. And like, they probably have some deep awareness that if they don't feel good and they're talking to a company that they're like so passionate and excited about, they don't want the, the right. They, they want to walk into that feeling confident. They want to feel that I prepared for this, <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. Um, yeah. Versus, versus I also hear a lot of people say before, before this, I, I would just wing it. <laughs> you know, And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> um, but then if you, if you have that approach and you are also worried about really great candidates being in the market, then that's probably not the best way to set up for success. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, for sure. That's, a, that's a daunting thing for anybody to know that there's just a ton of competition. And yeah. so how do you help people get into the mindset where they feel like they can, they can do this, they can leverage their background, they can leverage their experience and they're, they yeah. can be confident about that. Even, even today when at least from the headlines, it appears that there are just a ton of people out there doing the same things, looking for the same. I think uh, you have offers. a really great example of that really recently. Oh, well, <laughs> I will say that it, I will just say like, hey, one thing is just like understanding our constraints. So, you know, it is a very competitive job market. Like that's one thing the layoffs have done is they flooded the market with some really good talent. Um, although I would say that, you know, people who are laid off are not necessarily just generally speaking, in the best position to look for a job right away. That's why I say, like, just give yes. yourself time to process. Yes. So <laughs> um, it's not necessarily an immediate effect. But um, but I think, like, you know, the job, just understanding that, and you, we've all experienced this, it's very literal. It's like people want to have want to have a checklist, right? And they want to like, you know, like say, oh, okay, you had this experience in th this many years and this whatever. But here, here's the thing. It's when you're able to make a really good people to people connection and that kind of thing. Yes. You can transcend anything, any kind of restrictions or whatever, because then people feel like you could solve their problems or help them do this one thing that they really need help with. And that kind of thing, because I, you know, one of our clients just got an offer at a great, you know, unicorn company and um, he didn't even have this. It's a sales strategy and ops role. He didn't even have this uh, job as his core function for um, for any of his jobs. It was part of his function for a couple of jobs, but not even in in his whole career. Like right, so like it's just if you can demonstrate what you can do and that you understand where they are and and. Um, you know, because there wasn't really like it never even worked out at that kind of company, you know, and that kind of stuff. So it's just being able to make that good connection, one on one connection with people. That's a big so thing. interesting. Exactly. Yeah. So you just have to make sure that your story is clear mm. and then you're telling it to the right people. You do not want to apply to anything online and like you don't want to get into that headspace uh, because that's exactly where you're like, oh my God, I just saw 2,000 people apply to this job. <laughs> right. How what? So true. And then that is a true com competitive feeling. Mm -hmm. um, but, but what what it is is it's, it's noise, right? So according to some data, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, like a third of job postings are, you know, either sh they're shells to hold headcount um, for hiring freezes, or they are they're posted after they found the, the candidate or leader because they're posting it for compliance reasons. So yes. all these things will would create a sense of com, com, com competition and urgency. Um, so so you could just kind of maybe like let go of that noise um, and focus on the one on one conversations like Julie is talking about. But once you you know, because even the really talented, smart people from Google are applying online and not going anywhere. 80% of really highly mo motivated and like qualified people are just absolutely not getting rejected, right? Um, so 
there's all these feelings that aren't real because of the rejection that is not even seen by a human. Um, yep. So right. just really most refocus your energy towards how do I tell that story of my value and impact to the right people? Because yeah. all the competition, they're not doing that either. Yeah. And here's <laughs> the advantage of working with, I prefer to, you know, working with more experienced people, 40 and above, because they usually have really great networks. So yes. like, you know, oh, yes. with great, you know, and it's <laughs> always so surprising to them. They'll be like, oh, I haven't talked to that person in like 15 years. Yes. Or years. But they are sometimes the most helpful. And, yes. you know, Adam Grant has great statistics about this, but yeah. in this give and take yeah. book where he's talking about networking, it's the, sometimes the dormant or the like kind of, um, distant, uh, network, uh, connections we have are the most powerful because they wow. run in different circles. They know different people. Yeah. They're at different companies. And so that they become our gold nuggets and that kind of thing. But yeah. the, the ones that have, um, you know, very robust networks, and, and who may not be leveraging them or not leveraging them to help them with their job search. Um, once they kind of learn how to do that and how to be more strategic with that, then they get really good traction and, really then, good. and then they get advocates in the, in that company and that kind of thing. So that's where um, especially people with more extensive ex backgrounds and experience can really like have the competitive edge. Yeah. Yeah. And then one other, like, so, so you talked about a client, but I actually was thinking of another one, the one that got the offer at Stripe, mm -hmm. how he was like, oh, this is so competitive. Mm -hmm. um, and one other thing is like when you have that kind of imposter syndrome, it's like you still just have to do it. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that's also one thing. No way around it. <laughs> but but the outcome is going to be right right there, right? Uh, so if, if you're focusing on the right things, right? He got an amazing job and he felt the, the, the competition like – really come up for him. Um, but yeah, that's, that's so great and compelling. And I think these are the stories that we don't hear <laughs> that we need to. So I'm so glad you're sharing them right now. Um, one thing you said really resonated with me, which is the power of the network. And that is just by its very nature gathered over time, right? It's gathered yeah. through experience. And yeah. I have seen that to be true for sure. In my own world that has paid off in spades for me. Like it's totally a thing for sure. And so you that's an excellent network. Yeah. I do have an excellent, yeah. You guys are a great example of that. Uh, I do have a great network and that has been built steadily over time. And actually somewhat hilariously, that's been built also because I've gone to so many different companies. So everywhere I go, I have wound up finding these wonderful people that I connect deeply with and become frankly, lifelong friends. How long have I known you, Julie? I mean, it's, it's a thing that is, it's a gift and you know, I'm not saying I wouldn't love to stay at a company for a long time because I absolutely would, but it has <laughs> yeah, right. actually helped my network <laughs> to jump around. And there's there's definitely a little bit more of that sort of a mentality now, I would say, today with a lot of workers. It's like almost gig economy-esque. Um, I don't mm -hmm. think necessarily intentionally so, but because of the market conditions and at least the last few years, right, for sure. Mm -hmm. But it, and it's definitely something that I think is more prevalent, I would say, probably in like millennials and below. Um, but nevertheless... I see the the network thing is a, is a great strength and I'm so grateful for that. And that's something that you get over time. So amazing. That's one major point, big win for experience. But yeah. one thing that I have thought about, so, so un unfortunately for younger people, that means that they're going to have to wait a little bit to, to build that up. So that, that's one thing that, you know, there is a difference in age that actually doesn't benefit the younger person. But one element that I've been pondering and thinking about is around if you get older, if you're older and you have this powerful network, but you realize you kind of want to pivot out and do something different. And mm -hmm. maybe like, cause, cause to your point, when you have this network, you are so valuable. Like I, I know people who've been hired purely because of their network, because people know that people by people relationships are everything. It's the real currency. Someone said, that. I can't remember who I'm not going to quote them. Right. So I won't, but <laughs> Relationships are the real currency. And so you get that over time. So when people that you work with are kind of pivoting from one area to another, I mean, you just to give the example of the guy who wasn't, it wasn't his particular area of expertise and was yeah. able to land this job. Like, how do you advise people who are maybe pivoting from one area of a business to another, or maybe even to another sector? If you do that, I know you're mostly tech, but how do you, how do you help people through that particular yeah. difficulty? Great question. I think, um, so for me, I, let's just tackle not the sector part because that's a little bit harder, I think in some ways, but, um, 
but the uh, making a professional change. So, and we've had people like that have gone from like, you know, marketing to product or customer success to product or like, you know, yeah. like, <laughs> like um, but I think one thing that, um, that I tell people is just to know your entry point. And again, because the hiring process is so literal, it's more about like going in as the thing that you've been doing most recently, but making sure, and this is like, regardless of whether you're making a professional change or not, is adopting a company first mindset. So when you find the right company for you, then you will have opportunities. You're going to either create your own, you know, whether it's lateral uh, mobility you want or like upward mobility, but, or like, you know, like, and the lateral could be like just a professional change or that kind of thing. Um, But I think it's, it's, it's the easiest pathway and something that you probably would want to do anyway, because think about it, if you're going for a new profession and a new company, um, and I can think that's a lot of learning curves, right? You want to set yourself up for success. So go in with what you're doing and knowing that like, Hey, even if you're like bored of what you're doing or you're kind of tired of it, it, you still, you will still experience it differently because it is a different kind of challenge. Um, there's a big ramp up of learning the company and that kind of thing. And then you should apply your networking skills instead of the external parts is like in the company. And then that's where you start to like volunteer or like meet the people in that group. And you want to go to finance from operations or whatever. You start to like volunteer for some projects or you start to like say like, Hey, what, what skills do I need to actually learn here? You know? And because most like great companies um, will want to retain really good talent. And so like, they're going to support these kinds of moves. And it's, especially when you're kind of open about it, you know, once you've like established yourself and everything, it's like, Hey, I want to make this move to this, you know, who can help me? And you can just yeah. ask questions. Being okay. super resourceful. It's, it's funny that yeah. you mentioned that. Cause I actually realized now I did that myself in my career. Okay. Once when I was at Bloomberg, I was in this one particular line of the business that was very financial markets focused mm-hmm. and they were starting up a new initiative in Bloomberg law. And I knew that that's where I wanted to be. I'd worked at Court TV. I had been a paralegal. That was an odd fit. But I was like, okay, let's do these like semi-related legal things. I can probably parlay that into like enough of a narrative and story to get me there. And then I started shadowing people in my spare time and like asking all these questions and learning. And I, I kind of self-taught and had, you know, some really awesome people who helped me and just went and pitched myself. And I got grilled by the person who was leading that team. But she, she saw what I was capable of and was like, wow, okay, you're hired. And she brought me over, which they never let you do at Bloomberg. They were super strict. So it it can work even in organizations where they're like completely stringent with requirements and you sit in this seat for this many months and this is the process and blah, blah, blah. Like I was able to even circumvent that. So it takes some finesse. It takes some skills. And I don't think they're necessarily natural to everybody, which is why having a coach is such a great idea, right? <laughs> um, but I, I love that you're, you're talking about that aspect of it because it goes back to the intentionality, right? And you're talking about how do we find the right place to thrive? And I would love to kind of, for lack of a better term, and I hate this term, double click on that and talk about yeah. how you help people find the right company for them. Yeah. And it really starts with the criteria for them. So it's, it, it's sometimes considering things that people don't really think about. So it could be like, the size of the company stage and the size, not just because it's like, Oh, a certain amount of people, but usually it means like there's more resources, more training, or it could swing the other way. They like being having their hands in every pie. So it's like, you want to go for a smaller company and that kind of thing. So it's just really understanding where they have thrived in the past, but also checking in with what they want now, because sometimes it's like, Oh, you know, before I had a family, I could do all this stuff or whatever. Um, or now I don't have a family. And so, because they're out in the world right. and so point. I have more time to do this and this, you know, and Only take your risks. So it's just creating that criteria. And, um, you know, I have a set of questions and, and, and kind of framework for them to do that. Um, and then it's just like, you know, the really what's helpful is the networking. So there's no better information than insider information. So you want to like learn from yes. people, you know, do they really embody and live their core values? Uh, what is, um, you know, is the customer base strong? What is the growth rate? Like, is it really in growth mode? I always ask a good question. Like, are these nice to have products or a half to have product? Because yes. nice to haves are sometimes the first cut. Ah, cut, cut it's or a very cut different experience. Uh, right. Yeah. Yes. yeah mm-hmm. And I and have to have uh, a kind of solution might just be like, once a customer has it, like they cannot let go of it, you know, because it may be a nice to have from 
if you don't have it, but then once you do, you're, you're, you're got to have it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Give me more. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Never leave it. Yeah. Um, so those are the, just the kinds of things. And then, and then I think when, um, you know, I don't want to say any role is fine because that's not true either. We want to make sure that you're in a role that you can be really successful and that you actually enjoy because if you don't enjoy it, it's hard to be successful. Yeah. Um, but once you're in a great company then and, and they stay in touch with hundreds of our clients, then I get to see them, you know, get promotions or move into other groups awesome. or, you know, like go in as an IC, but then later run a team of 50, you know, and that yeah. kind of stuff. So it's really like fun just to see their progression um, and their many like successes that they have. Yeah. It's really nice. I love that how you can just kind of take the, the, the long view and watch people progress and know that you had a part to play in it. That's so nice. Do yeah. you, I guess I'm curious. So, so you start with the, the human, the actual person, which is an awesome place to begin and you unpack like, okay, well, what do you really want? What have you liked? What have you disliked about your past jobs and like where you actually want to go. And then you start to kind of pull together a sense of the s- sorts of companies that might fit the bill for that person, sorts of roles, roles that would fit the bill for that person. Do you, I mean, I guess as people are thinking about applying for jobs right now, right, of any age, what are some ways that you can kind of figure out red flags that might not necessarily be super obvious out of the gates? Like how, how can you help people land those actual dream jobs versus the ones that seem so amazing? And then you get there and you're like, what is this? (laughs) Yeah. Uh Yeah. And one thing I didn't mention with the networking is like, you don't, uh, I think a common mistake people make is when they assume that it has to be first degree connection. So someone they know, which really limits the universe of companies you can talk to and they only talk to one. So like I say, talk to at least five people and hopefully different groups and that kind of thing. You want to get like a wide variety of perspectives, see if there's consistency or inconsistency. Cause I think a lot of inconsistency is a little bit of a yellow flag. If they say, Oh, the top priorities for the company is this. And then another person says, no, it's that, you know, it's like, <laughs> that, that kind of stuff, there's, there's something missing, some kind of cohesiveness or leadership or something like that. And then I, you know, the, and then there's just like, just like, like, this is my made up stat, but I'm like only 5% of the population is meant for early stage startups because mm. they're so volatile. <laughs> it's like, you know, series A, B, C. I'm like, they're still trying to figure out product market fit. They're like, they can change on a dime. The leadership definitely changes at some point, yeah. you know, but they'll multiple- tell you none of those things. So to yeah. your point, you have to just know. <laughs> <they're telling> you. <laughs> right. Right. But it sounds like really sexy and it sounds like so cool. And they're disrupting yeah. changing the world. Yeah. Right. But, the, but totally. the long, the the short answer is still networking, right? Um, yeah. But if everyone's on the same, it, but you're right about uh, they wouldn't tell you. So I would say like <laughs> probably the C-level won't tell you. But if you're able to connect with like people are in the day-to-day, they might be a little bit more candid with you. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and especially you know, people outside yeah. of the interview loop. Because uh, yes. Yes. the interview yes. loop, they want you in there because you're going to, they're a key stakeholder of sorts, yeah. right? So they want your help. And so like getting 100%. outside of the interview loop is good. Exactly. Um, I've, and then there's other uh, things, Mo, like it's just like, when they're not U.S. based companies, if we're talking about people based in the U.S., that's harder. If even if you're on the West Coast working for an East Coast company, it's like it will. It, and even if they say remote, like they there's like if there's a, a especially a, a hub of leaders um, in one concentrated area and it's a different time zone. If you're fine with like starting earlier or starting later, that's OK. But you got to kind of go in eyes wide open. Um that's like one part too. And like, oh yeah, the, like, you know, we've had companies that have said work from anywhere, like around the world. So I had this one client who, uh, I'll just say joined Atl- Atlassian, right. And they're like known to be a really great company, but yeah, his team yeah. was like on five continents or something. And so like That's he was hard. in meetings day all day, like, you know, yeah. he had like the middle of the day as a break. And I'm like, that's not good. Cause he had <laughs> really early and then really late, you yeah. know, like, 9 p.m. meetings. Like, and so what do you want out of your life? You know? work out. So like you just <laughs> is that what you want? <laughs> about well, well, that's the thing. Yeah. So so your question about red flags is do you know your red flags mm-hmm. um, to be able to be able to find them, right? So yeah. um, so then when you show up for the networking, you are asking questions in a not negative way, but that you're yeah. looking for. Curious. Yeah, you're curious. Because yeah, obviously right. everyone's had some experiences where they're like, oh, no, I don't want that again. Yeah. <laughs> so... so by being able to talk to people outside of the interview loop, you'll probably get more awareness. But you yeah. do, you also have have self awareness for that. Too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like you said, they're incentivized to want to hire you. If they have a gap they need to fill, they want you in, and they will probably tell you the the best version 
story that they yeah. can because it's it's PR. But one one other yeah. one other yeah. thing that I have done, which I, mm-hmm. I highly recommend to people, and you probably tell people to do this too, or maybe maybe you don't because it's a little a little out there. But mm-hmm. I tell people that before they accept a job, they should actually go to LinkedIn and figure out who left the company recently, oh, and someone oh, in yeah. like hopefully close to your role, like in at least the same org, and then ask them why they left. Mm-hmm. Because you're going to get unfiltered <laughs> responses yeah. there. People yeah. do not hold back in that regard. So that's actually, that's that's my little secret pro tip. I tell everyone to do that before they take a job because uh, yeah. you can get a little insights. Of course, a lot of insights, but of course you have to take it all with a grain of salt. Okay. You never know the full story. There are two sides yeah. to everyone and the middle right. is probably what's true, right? So, but it's just someone who's not incentivized in any way, shape or form exactly. by whether you take this job or not, they're going to give you the real scoop. Right, yep. exactly. So, cool. Pro tip. Oh, no. Pro tip from someone who's moved around a bit. <laughs> yeah. Take Julie's advice. Uh, she, she, yeah. Anyway, we'll leave that there. But um, so, okay. So we, we, we kind of went over some of the red flags you could look out for some of the ways in which you can kind of center yourself on what you actually want. Organic versus intentional, all of that. Like if you could give some sort of a, a hopeful message to the people today who are out there trying to make a change in this particular landscape. Like what are some key, maybe actionable steps that you would advise they undertake to get to this point? Of course, one of them working with you, but you know, what could you leave people with in that realm? Okay. So you deserve your dream job and mm-hmm. you could have it. Um, it, it, it. And it exists. It definitely exists. Even if you feel like it can't, I hear that a lot. Um <laughs> This is a little you must bit hear a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> this one's a little bit more of a, I think, a tactical advice. Mm-hmm. That's great. Tactical is great. Yeah, if you're looking for a job, and I would say this is probably if you have some experience, if you're if you have more than five years, seven years of experience, please do not apply to jobs online. It's going to affect your confidence. It's going to make you think so many things that shouldn't even be in your brain. So I, I would say like, that's, that's awesome my main advice. right now. <laughs> yeah. Awesome yeah. advice. <laughs> I can't yeah. tell you how many posts I've seen all over LinkedIn. I've put in hundreds of applications online, yada, yada, yada. Like yeah. that is everywhere. Like, I mean, constantly, I mean, there's some days I can't even open LinkedIn because it's just like so depressing to look at. And it makes me, it just makes my stomach drop, you know, because pe- yeah. people are hurting. But like you said, it's, it's a lot of the, I'm applying online conversation, right? It, and, yes, yes. And I don't know if that's because they don't know how to network or if they're already yeah. trying that and the other, but it just, it makes me so bummed out because like you, I know that that's not how most people land their jobs. Like yeah. I have almost never, actually, I think I've landed a job. No, wait, maybe ne- Bloomberg. I landed Bloomberg that way. And literally none of my other jobs came from that. So I'm, I'm privileged to have advice, a right? great network. Yeah. Oh yeah, Yeah. especially, but yeah. So I know that to be true, but Mm -hmm. it sounds like not everybody does. So thank you for pointing that out. And and it's for the reasons that you mentioned is because there isn't a good framework to do something else. Like, Oh, there's a job posting. That's how I'm going to get my job at Amazon or that's probably not a good example. Uh, That's how I'm going to get my job here or whatnot. Um, But like, that is, that seems to be the way Mm -hmm. Um, I was like 98% of people do it that way and then figure out that that's not the way and then they have to find a new way and they're like oh of course I know it's networking um, but I don't know how to do that and I'm kind of introverted um, but that's because they're thinking of networking as this like grandiose thing where they like go to a, an event and like work the room not you don't need to have that skill set if you can show up for a one-on-one conversation and listen really well you are an excellent networker that's just so the, true. The, the truth. Yeah. yeah. And if you think with a mindset of reciprocity, like how can you help this person? If you lead with that, that's, that's key. Sometimes you actually really can't. And I've struggled with that where I'm with someone where I'm like, I can offer you literally nothing. Thank you for talking to me at all. <laughs> like nothing. But I don't like the reciprocity kind of I, the concept. And this is one thing that I do help clients shift because they really hold the back. Like, Hey, I, first of all, they don't like to ask for help. And second, I have nothing to give. It's, it's kind of like if you zoom out and you kind of, even if you don't believe in karma, it's more about like this concept of like, mm. you're if, if you're open to meeting with other people in the future or present, like to help them out and you can, and you know how good that, that feels. 
giving other people the opportunity to help you. Because if you think like, I have to bring something to the table, I, I think you're going to be stuck. And I don't think that's the right kind of uh, mindset either on that. So I, yeah. I just challenged that a little bit. I think um, that's a great challenge. Yeah. I'm going to work on it. Yeah. And then I, I still also, do it anyway, but I'm going to go forward with like more confidence in doing it. Be like, and I'm going to give back when I can. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Love right. it. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Cause it's a scorecard and scorecards are hard to manage. Right. Like, you know, true, true. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah but I would say like the, my biggest advice is don't be constrained by job boards. So Mai's absolutely right. Like applying online doesn't work because of many things. If you, I do have a book and it does explain yeah. why ETS systems don't work and that kind of thing and how yes. it affects your psyche in an adverse way. But the, but even beyond that, like if you're only looking at job postings, you're very limited. There is this, you know, hidden job market okay. um, or where, where there are like actually a lot of hiring managers, they have headcount, they can change the headcount in different ways or you know, you might just be able through this one-on-one -on -one networking surface opportunities are coming up this quarter, next quarter, you know, in two quarters. And so like you will just be ahead of everyone else when you, when you understand this, or it's like they convert a headcount. I had it for this, but now that I've talked to you, we could really use your help in this. So, you know, yes, it's full creation. Happens. Um, there's but, magic that can happen behind yes. the scenes. Like there's oh, more yeah. than the yeah. eye can see. Yeah. 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 There, I have one more based off the times. Yes. So I hear a lot, um, Maybe it's just, I, I'm so, I'm unhappy at my job, um, but it's not a good time because there's this recession. Mm. It's a good time to start at any time that you feel like you need something new um, because all it is is a conversation, right? So, so people are like reading headlines and then they, they stop themselves from fulfillment because they feel it's not a good time, but it's better to start your job search, which is how do I start having meaningful conversations? Um, how do I how do I start thinking about my company target list? Like things that feel good. Like you 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 ought to start that sooner versus having something like a quote unquote recession hold you back. Right? Um, yeah. it, it's you'll actually be ahead if you start now. Yeah, yeah. And That's not only that, like the clients, the clients we see have the most straightforward um, job search journey are the ones that actually like their job or like can find a lot of gratitude for having their job or like they can see the benefits of, you know, yeah. <laughs> whatever they're doing and, and they yeah. still enjoy it. If you wait until that point where you're like burned out or frustrated or like yeah. got to get out of here, again with dating, <laughs> yeah. morning, then, then it, it's, it's, it's a much more <laughs> wayward mm -hmm. job search Just for those like people. Dating. So like, I yeah. And people, like, yeah, sometimes when they say like, oh, I actually like my job. I'm like, great. Like, you know, and have you thought about your career right. path here? And if they don't have a career path there, or if they're not thinking kind of more, just even a couple of years, not, not very long term. It, but I, I tried to introduce this idea of like starting to then at least expand your network during this time, you know, like learn about different companies, meet yeah. different people, learn what's possible because you don't want to wait until this breaking point. Absolutely. And to your earlier point, if you have already landed on a company specifically for that company and not necessarily just the specific role, if you know it checks the boxes for you long term and it's a place you want to be, like even if you find yourself in a suboptimal role, like you'll have avenues. If you're if you're out of the gates thinking about the network internally within that company, you're gonna have different opportunities because let's face it. We are always mm -hmm. one management change away from hating our jobs because your manager is the number one thing about whether you like a job and whether you're going to stay or not. Yeah. And yeah. that changes. True. People leave. Companies yeah. reorg, you know? So oh, yeah. like the right oh, company yeah. is so important. And if you make those connections and those inroads, like from day one, you're setting yourself up for potential success long-term versus like just being very siloed in your specific mm -hmm. role under mm -hmm. your specific leadership. So yeah. that's super yeah. true. Yeah. Very true. Super true. So I wanted to ask you, I know this is kind of like the, the underbelly, like the unpleasant reality aspect of this, but I know, I know you have clients who are mostly over 40 and mm -hmm. you know, that's like the main part of your business. The people you serve is over 40, which is awesome because clearly they are having success and you guys are coaching them into having fulfillment in their careers and finding their dream jobs. It's awesome. I know 
you've also experienced some clients who've, who've maybe had a little bit of challenge. And, and I'd love to hear just a bit more about those people, mostly to just like ground and validate people who have had troubles, because I know age bias is real. Like that's for sure. I want to make sure we show like a full spectrum of there's also this great bright spot over here and people are doing wonderfully. Like I want to profile yeah. all of that and, and specific companies that are great with age diversity and employing people across the spectrum of ages, but yeah. Also share like some of the experiences that maybe some of your clients have had that have been a little bit difficult and how you help them overcome those and land the jobs they need. Yeah. When I was listening to one of your um, prior po podcasts, it was, I think, Thank you. Corey, it was, um, you know, she said something like sometimes people will say like, oh, you, you see too senior for this or why do you actually want this and that kind of stuff. So if you're like, and I, I can't even say sometimes it's representative of the company. Sometimes it is just the individual or like, you know, Good person. Point. So like, so I'd say again, that's why you want to talk to multiple people and you want to yes. see like, you know, if there's a, a, a range of ages and that kind of thing, because why would you want to work at a company who's skeptical at this or like, for a leader right. who, who's questioning, <laughs> you know, so about you. your background and that kind of thing. So I'd say that's number one thing. Again, like kind of look for the right places and where you can thrive again and, and feel good about what you're doing. Um, you know, and it's really just the enterprise companies that usually have the DEI initiatives and, and that kind of thing. And, I, you know, whether they're considering age or not, I'm not sure yet. But with this aging population and more and more people, you, getting, you know, isn't working longer because of like the cost of living and re yes. shrinking retirement funds and all these other things. Like, I think we, there will be a shift in, um, you know, trend wise with just having more diversity in our workforce. But I will say like the, the clients that have, you know, whether they recognize it or not, but like the ones that have the most difficulty or the longest duration of finding jobs are really in their late fifties and early sixties. And so um, that's where I do see like there are um, some hurdles there, you know, and it's again, them now, the ones that do make it fine and not even part of this conversation feel very good about where they are and their age and their experience. So like, that's yeah. one thing, but if they start to like, you know, kind of have these doubts around it and that kind of thing. And it's a reality, like, again, it's like just knowing our constraints, what are our constraints. And then it's just kind of, you know, continuing to talk to people that have this until you find people that have this genuine interest in you because they have this understanding of what you can do and bring and that kind of thing. And then, you know, getting them to help you through the, the hiring process or becoming your internal champion or advocate and that kind of thing. And I think that's key. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Totally agree. Totally agree. And and you're right. The data does actually bear that out. Like the, if you are over 55 and unemployed, chances are there's a New York Times article about this. Chances are it wasn't your choice to leave and you're going to have a much longer time finding a job than yeah. you had in the past. And you're likely to find a job that's going to pay you less than what you left the market at your last company with. So th yeah. there are yeah. some realities there. But I'm hoping that we're going to start shifting. And, and your other point about DEI initiatives only 8% of them include age as a factor right now, even though age yeah. is an underrepresented group within tech. Yeah. And that's literally yeah. verbatim in the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission's diversity in high tech report. And they're like, it needs to be studied more. I put a FOIA request in, I'm still waiting to hear back because I want to understand the, yeah. what's the data, like what's it actually say about how many people of certain age ranges are in these tech companies as a whole. So I, we don't have the full picture, but they know that it's it's not representative across the age bands that it should be in terms of proportions. But, uh, you know, some of that maybe it's explicable. Some of it's maybe not great. It, it, I don't know, but it, it's for real. And uh, I think there is also uh, when when there's a collision of isms, like different discriminations that come together, age and being a person of color, age and being a woman, so on and so forth. Like, I think it's exponentially potentially harmful. And so people have to I don't, I don't want people to like fret about it because, you know, these things, are, we can't change our age or race. This is just who we are. And so we can't like shy away from it. It's just reality. Yeah. 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 So it's reality. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's reality. Mm -hmm. And sometimes reality bites, but we're yeah. going to figure out how to make moves. I mean, we've already made some strides. I think uh, what's happened with the layoffs, which I read in, in a GeekWire article recently, is that uh, you're 65% more likely to lose your job if you're a female in tech right now, which is, yeah. which is a really dismal statistic. And yeah. I have a hypothesis about that around it being centered on specific functions within companies that tend to be more 
yeah. female centric or female yeah. filled with the jobs. So I think that could come into play, but it'll be once the dust settles in this, like you said, quote unquote recession kind of works its way through, it'll be really yeah. interesting to see what, what is shown by actual hard data and figures, not just how we feel and how it appears in the headlines. Right. Yeah. So yeah, yeah that's really true. Like, fascinating. You know, the areas that really kind of hold the test of time are, you know, first of all, products and engineering, because that's what, you know, the lifeblood of the company, right? You need to have something to sell, right? And something that benefits some group of people. And then anything that's revenue generating or close to revenue generating. So anything else can be cut. Like, you know, yeah. I don't think should be cut, but like, you know, <laughs> but, are, but are usually the first things that get cut in a company. So, and you're yeah. right, like those might like HR marketing, some, you know, other kinds of um, things might be more, have more women than men. Yeah. yeah. And I don't think it's like a malicious thing that people are doing. I think it's just kind of an unfortunate reality, but yeah. we will probably have some some work to do in terms of getting back to where we were on that front. So, so one thing we kind of touched on in the beginning here was the concept of getting aged out of tech mm. companies. And that's something that's definitely weighed heavy on my mind, like even from the beginning of my entry into this world and something that I just kind of saw playing out and it, it just supply and demand number of roles available. Like it just seems like it gets smaller, smaller, right. As you, as you keep going and there's kind of this, this expectation that you should keep climbing or you might necessarily be considered less of a performer or like you haven't done enough for, and I've heard this actually from people who are business leaders who sometimes who've shared with me off the record, like, yeah, I see someone in their forties or fifties and they're this IC and they've been in that role for a while. And I think, why haven't you done more yet? And I'm like, Ooh, and I think there's two different lanes where if you've only risen, and you're older, you think everything's fine because you don't know what the you know other people in your organization are <laughs> feeling. So it's yeah. just like about not being exposed to that percept that that mindset and like that kind of person because of just different uh, different areas of the business, different you know your different status for for example. But how do you like tell me a little bit about the people that you work with who are in non managerial or like kind of lower management roles and how they continue to have awesome, fulfilling careers, you know, what sorts of things yeah. do you guide them towards in terms of the types of companies and like, how do you help them navigate that and that specific fear about being aged out if they don't climb the ladder? Right. And it's a great question because you're right. It does get more narrow and narrow. So just like even logically thinking like not, you can't, not everyone who's in any kind you of can't all be the boss can have progression <laughs> every year or every stage of their age, you know, as they like, yeah. well. And, um, and, and we talked to a lot of people too, that say like, you know, Hey, my peers are here and I'm only here. Or I thought at 45, oh, I would be compare, at least a director, oh you know, God, and I but I'm like, yes. when did you come up with that goal? Like, oh, it's 23. Uh, starts early. Like, um, do you even it want that? Because it means this, this, and this. And I'm like, oh, I don't know if I want it, but I want the prestige or I want the whatever. Yeah. So it's like just kind of like digging in a little bit more and ask and understanding why that motivation is or when it was created um, or like associating with success, success with leadership, you know, and that kind of thing. So I'd say the way that I, you know, most of the, the senior level ICs and we've worked with many, um, uh, what, what has resonated or what I've learned from them and really is authentic to them is when they can say like, Hey, I really just love, you know, like building processes, like really streamlining things. Like I, I work and a lot of them do lead, but they lead cross-functional teams. So they don't have any directs or that kind of thing, but they are a leader. And I, I think when you're leading anything, you can call yourself a leader, uh -huh. you know? And so um, it's kind of like, oh, like owning that, leaning into it and feeling really good about it. And when they do that and they really just are really good at explaining again, positioning and like understanding their story as like, Hey, this is what I love doing. And that's what I want to do for the rest of my career and they awesome. own it, then people feel really good about it. Yeah. You know? I love that. Yeah. Well, There's an excellent from. idea. Oh, yeah. 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 And I can tell you from my own personal experience, I've been up for jobs because so, I'm like, I want to lead a team. Like, I think this is great for me. I can do it. And when I get caught up in the interview process and they're like, but you, but you haven't led a huge team before. Like but, but, I actually kind of flip it around and I say, actually what I've done as a leader is harder than just having a team because yeah. I've had to make people, I've had to exert influence over people who have absolutely no reason to talk to me, listen to me, whatever. Like they don't owe me anything. They don't have to do what I say. And I've yeah. been able to achieve outcomes that like go cross functionally across the organization and even outside because I'm in partnerships. Right. And like, it's much harder. 
it's way harder. Much harder. So <laughs> that's yes. my that's my mic drop like on that. So I'm like got that covered. So I love yeah. that. Really, really good, really good point. And uh, I think people, leadership takes many different forms. It's not all linear, and not everyone should be a leader. And by the way, I know people who've gotten there and thought it was going to be this amazing pinnacle and like it's going to be so yeah. incredible, and yeah. they hate it. And they're not suited for it. And then they feel stuck and they feel like they can't go back, you know? So it's, it's interesting. You don't know what you want till you're there. So to your point, networking, sharing experience, talking to people, really figure out what you want, really want and what you don't want. (laughs) They're both important. Exactly. Both important. Both important. Someone is saying like, like, Oh, if, if the want is rooted based off of something external, like someone else's, um, success that there's a there's a hint there to 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 ask more questions for yourself right like if you can answer that yourself that would be better but it is really good to have a coach to soundboard that out because we hear a lot of time i don't we don't know what we don't know right so like once that like very poignant question gets asked your brain starts to think of it in a different way but yeah Mm -hmm. you guys are exceptional at what you do i know because i benefit from from your wisdom as your friend and as your past colleague julie and i (laughs) i have to actually credit the very existence of this podcast in large part to both of you because (laughs) you've been the best at helping me get out of my own way and seriously like literally if it weren't for you i have a lot of people in my world who are like oh that sounds tough or you already have a great job or like it'll be too risky and what if it fails and all that and you guys gave me the exact opposite energy so anyway (laughs) thank you this conversation is being had like in very large part due to you and your friendship so thank you and thank you mo and thank you for bringing this great topic to oh my gosh absolutely and i have to say this too like you guys are exceptional at what you do. You're amazing human beings. You get this world. What what advice would you give this audience about having a long, fulfilling career in tech? And like, what resources would you suggest that they leverage in their pursuit of that dream job? I think um, the main thing is like, it's never too late. Like sometimes we work with people who are like, oh, I want to be in the workforce for five more years or, you know, less than 10. But it's never too late to have a job that you really love and thrive in. And and sometimes the, you know, you hear like people like, well, it's a good paycheck or, you know, this or that, or I need the benefits for my family. I I think they're, they're starting to associate things that they think they can't have if they have a really great job. Right. And, um, and thanks to like the millennial generation and Gen Z. (laughs) I know, hat tip. (laughs) There is this expectation and drive for like flexibility and work-life balance things that um, from my Gen X generation, I can actually appreciate and really value. And so, um, you know, and there's more desire around that and that kind of thing. So it's like, I, I want to say like, you can have it all as long as what you want is really true to what you want. So like, so right. I think if you actually really sit down and think about it and like the, the things that are most important to you, you can have it all. And so like, you shouldn't just box yourself in because you you're only focusing on the the benefits or the highlights of what you actually have, which is great. Like you want to be grateful for what you have, but you can have more too. Yeah. Yeah. And like no either or think or black and white. Like if I get a better job, if I get a job that I feel happier in, I'm not going to get paid as much. Like there's all these like, right. People think that. that. And how many times is that true? It's almost never true. Like if you really (laughs) dig into it, Um, but but we all have our own hangups. And Mm -hmm. um, so we all do. So yes. we, it's better to share the, those experiences so that you can get real, like, poignant, like, expert advice from it. Um, but, yeah. But in terms of resources, Julie just wrote a book mm-hmm. um, called Dream it. Job. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> and all the resources around the networking, structuring your target list, what an organic versus an intentional career is, it's all in there. Um it's really good. So I would say that's a great resource. Yeah. It just goes like, I think like the half more over half of the book is the actual steps that you, you can take to have a pretty straightforward job search. And so it's really pragmatic, you know, it walks you through like, you know, how to get, build that clarity and how to, you know, position yourself in your professional branding and tell your story, prepare for interviews, identify those target companies right. and how to map out your strategy for networking and that kind of thing. And all the way to negotiation. Even so, the, yeah, yeah, even the messaging, like how, if I'm reaching out to a shared connection to to meet someone at this other company, what does that sound like? Sometimes we like word, I mean, 
we we're like, hey, look at all when it's actually just like two sentence, two three sentences in terms and people, of people. People all have ADD <laughs> now, so we yeah, need to yes, make it two absolutely. sentences, <laughs> right? Yeah, right. and you are coming from a genuine and authentic standpoint, and that yeah. always comes mm-hmm. through. It's when you start feeling really like closed about it, meaning like, oh no, no, like no one wants to hear from me, and I never respond to people when they reach out to me. Yeah, it, it gets in your in the way of your. Right it's true. I, <laughs> but I think people are, even though I joke a lot, I'm like, oh, I hate people. I love people and people are generally <laughs> good and kind and they want to help you. And if you just ask, usually the answer is yes. Like I, I've been shocked. People who have no reason to even talk to me, just ask. And they're like, sure, I'll, I'll come on your podcast. That kind of, I mean, it's just people right. love helping other people. The so key is just ask. Help yourself. Yes. Yeah. Stops. Miss yeah. 100% of the shots you don't take, blah, blah, blah. You know, right. it's, it's well, actually right. true. <laughs> it's like, yeah, thank you. Perfect. Sports. We got a sports <laughs> reference in. I'm so proud of us. Amazing. Um, you guys, this was so awesome. I am so grateful to both of you. Just everything that you guys brought to the table today is so impactful and so tangible and, and actionable and just really helped kind of clarify what's really happening and how to help people get out of their own way and uh, and really have a wonderful future ahead of them no matter what their age is so thank yeah. you so much for being here i'm psyched thank you thank for having you. us thanks for having yes. dream job catcher love you guys this is great love, love you too. too thank you so much <laughs>